Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Spirit and Life Bible Study. My name is Jonathan. Our reader is Cara tonight. And I'm thinking about all of you who are out there online and watching this in real time or at some later point. And people who are getting the audio, people on the phone, friends up in Canada, and so on. Sending you love. And our topic tonight is repentance, the nouns. And what I mean by that, <laughs> uh, we're in a rare situation where I actually have an idea of what I'll be talking about next week, which usually I don't. Okay. Next week we'll be talking about repentance, the verbs. And what I mean by the verbs is what are the actions that you actually take? What are the concrete steps of repentance? But this time I thought before we even talk about the verbs, we need to talk about the nouns, about what is it that we are repenting on? What is the object? Or the analogy that came, a couple of different analogies came to mind, but um, uh, a sort of violent analogy for you manly men out there uh, and women is uh, <laughs> like hunting. If we were hunting, you want to know what you're hunting for. You know, are you hunting for this? If, if you see a squirrel, is that, do you want that? Or do you want the deer? Or what are you looking for? Or, uh, you know, uh, a more domestic analogy might be shopping or something where, where you go out, you know, what exactly are we looking for when we're going on the search, which will be one of our verbs, what are we looking for when we go through repentance? Uh, there you go. Let's open with a prayer, shall we, friends? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all power has been given to you in heaven and on earth. We pray for your presence among us, Lord, your presence in the word. You are the word made flesh. You bowed the heavens and dwelt among us. We pray for you to give us guidance, Lord. Show us the truth of your word. Show us the actions that you would have us take so that we may be closer to you, so that we may eventually be in you and you in us. Amen. 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 Thank you all for coming. Um, very excited to talk to you about this. Um, the, the nouns and what I'm looking for specifically, we might have a few, uh, well, I need to, I do need to make an, a linguistic disclaimer at the beginning, uh, which is that um, just as the mountain is of the valley and the valley is of the mountain, so nouns are of verbs and verbs are of nouns. Uh, you can't really artificially separate, it's artificial to separate them in the way that I'm doing tonight, but I still thought there was a use to saying w the what of it is what we're looking at uh, tonight, and then the how is what we're doing next week, because the, uh, you can't really talk about the how very well if you don't know what it is, what, what, what we're looking for. So there are various different words. What I did to put this together was to just search for, uh, in Bible search tools, for the word repent, or uh, lay aside, or lay apart, or depart from, or cast off, or things of this kind. You know, the sort of repentance language that's in Scripture. What is the thing that we're supposed to be laying aside, or casting aside, and so on. And we'll be jumping all over the scriptures tonight to, to look at these things. There aren't a, a million passages, but we'll be looking and I'll be putting certain words on the board. Uh, so let's, um, hmm, let's start with the first book of Kings. So that's in your Old Testament in the historical portion. So sort of in the first quarter of the book. And we're looking at first Kings eight verse 47. This is a, a chapter I love very much where Solomon dedicates the, the temple. Um, look at verse 47 there. We're just jumping right in. Oh, let's look at verse 46 because that's a good one. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. Oh, hmm. Okay, there's no one who doesn't sin. Hmm. Okay, so if they sin against you, this is to Solomon speaking to God. And you become angry with them and deliver them to the enemy, and they take them captive to the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet when they come to themselves in the land where they were carried captive and repent, 
and make supplication to you in the land of those who took them captive, saying, saying, we have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. Okay, we got three in one go there, did we not? That was good. What do we have? We had sin, wrong, and wickedness, did we not? Yeah. Okay, that's a three for her, isn't it? <laughs> that's great. So the 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 problem with those words is that they are what I might call generic. Right? Like it doesn't specify what it is. Well, it's just sin. Well, what's that? Well, it's something that's wrong. Well, what do you mean by wrong? Well, it's wicked. You know, it's bad. <laughs> you shouldn't do it. Well, we, we don't know any, anything about what that is yet, and you will see a number of generic terms of this kind in Scripture for what we're supposed to repent of. But fear not. Before we're done tonight, I hope you will feel that you have had your surfeit of uh, nouns and adjectives about what we're, uh, you know, I'm not going to write them all on the board, but uh, you did write bad. I could write bad up there for sure. And we will shortly be getting evil. I might as well put that, save myself a trip. <laughs> <coughs> all right. Uh, let's jump. We're going to be jumping a lot tonight. Good exercise for you. Jump into the New Testament to the right of the Gospels, get in the epistles, and about in the middle of the epistles is Hebrews there, which is luckily some 13 chapters long, so it's not too difficult to find. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Weight? Huh. That's interesting. What does that mean? Lay aside every weight. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. Hmm. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hmm. And go on and read the next one just because it's so awesome. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, so there's weight and sin and a mention of laying aside. That early one was repenting. This is laying aside of uh, the sin. Um, oh, let's turn back in the New Testament to the Gospel of Matthew. Let's look at Matthew 9, verse 13. See what that says. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Hmm. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yes, the implication being that sinners are people who sin and that they need to be called to repentance. It's such an astounding statement, isn't it? It just seems sometimes like some uh, strains of Christianity focus a lot on the righteous and even will ostracize sinners and so, and so on. Um, and, and yet Jesus is saying, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's the main thing that he's interested in. Uh, oh, look at uh, Mark. So turn to the right, get to Mark chapter 1. Verse 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Yes. So we have another problem down there, whatever remission mean, means, but I, I think of it as meaning uh, it's the sending away, literally. It's forgiveness or, you know, when you have cancer and you go into remission, it means it's not an issue anymore. Um the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In other words, the nouns, what are you repenting of? Well, it's, it's sins. We still don't know what those are, but that's certainly what we're repenting of. Uh, one more like this. To go to Luke, the next one to the right, chapter 15. 
go to verse uh, <coughs> 7 there. Hmm. About the lost sheep. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So interesting, isn't it? And you wonder, is there really such a thing as a person who needs no repentance? I, I think the Lord's a little tongue-in-cheek here <laughs> that he's talking about people who <laughs> think they need no repentance. Uh, but he puts it in a very motivational way just to say uh, that there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who <coughs> repents. Such a beautiful thought because when you become aware, one of the risks of going through repentance uh, is that you know, you, you, you can feel bad about yourself, you feel bad about these things that you've done, you feel the burden of guilt or, or whatever it is and remorse and so on. Uh, it's so important that the Lord says that that very thing that you're going through causes heaven this great rejoicing. You know, they're not sitting up there going, oh, I'm horrified. You, you did what? Uh, they're just overjoyed at the thought that you might be able to move away from that thing. One reason that we're talking about this right now is that this I think of as a season for repentance. I, I like to say something about repentance in every class, if at all humanly possible. <laughs> but um, uh, we're getting to Easter season is about four weeks away, isn't it? Something like that. And uh, this is a time that going back for centuries in Christianity has been associated with repentance, uh, with confession and so forth. Uh, and uh, obviously taking of the supper or communion or Eucharist, whatever people call it in our different traditions, uh, which is a ceremony of repentance and so forth. So I thought it was a good time to start thinking about if you feel so moved, if the Lord calls you to do some repentance in this Easter season, uh, to think about what, what are we doing when we go through repentance. And it's important to know that heaven is overjoyed when we tackle this process. And I want to say a little bit more, too, about um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things that, that is difficult about repentance, and yet is really part of the point, is that when we start, we may feel actually attached uh, to whatever that evil is, whatever the wrong or the sin and the wickedness, the bad thing. We feel attached to it, almost like you're... Oh, it, it's like a, a, a growth on your body, but your own nerves and your own blood, you know, like you feel it. You know, it's, it's like something that you've uh, thought of as yourself. It's, it's part of your system. And yet the way lo the Lord looks at it is that that's not part of you. He sees you as separate from that issue and wants you to go through repentance so that we can create more separation between us. If there could just be a little bit of a gap between you and that issue, uh, an analogy that came to mind, perhaps uh, uh, for, for whatever reason, um, uh, is when you have pans in your house, you know, they get a lot of use and, and so on, and it just inevitably seems to happen that, that certain pans get this buildup of stuff and there's just gunk that you can't get rid of. Or, or when you have a baking sheet, you know, it turns brown over time because you just, you can never quite get all of it. And it gets to the point where some of that discoloration or that junk uh, is like welded on, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's just an immovable object. With a regular just sort of scrub or, or water, you, you can't get rid of that thing. And so it's as if it's part of the pan. And yet from the Lord's point of view, no, that's, that's gunk. That, that's not part of the pan. Uh, and the Lord wants to create a separation between that, if you follow my analogy, uh, you know, so getting some steel wool, if you're not going to harm the pan, the Lord doesn't want to harm the pan at all, but just get something that's strong enough, soak it for a while or something, be able to make that distinction. That's what the Lord wants. And we think, oh no, the Lord's going to look at me. I, you know, I, I'm stained. I'm, you know, I've got this gunk in my corners and everything. And the Lord is looking at you with love and saying, that's not even really part of you, you know. I can get that off if you want me to. I, I, I'm strong enough to get this stuff off. So it, these kind of things can activate stuff in us, or our shame or whatever. You know, that we, oh, no, I've been awful. And, and repentance always has that risk in it, that it will kick up some of that stuff. But if we really follow the steps, uh, 
it will do good things for us. And you'll start to realize, no, that's not me. It's inevitable when you start, you feel like it is you. But this is the very process that creates some separation between us and these issues. Uh, oh, let's look at one more. Turn to the right and we'll go through John and we'll get to Acts. Chapter 2, very famous uh, passage here. Um, 2 verse 38, this is the day of Pentecost. And they all wanted to know what to do. Look at verse 37. They were pricked in their heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, What shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Yes, that's right. There it is again. Repentance is about the remission of sins. Um, that's how you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is by going through this process. Okay, uh, why don't we have a look at some passages about evil. That'll be fun. Oh, by the way, uh, if you wish, you could see uh, episode 115 of the Bible study. We're up to 172 now, which is, this is 173, I think, tonight. Uh, on November the 7th, 2012, it was called Repentance, the Details. Uh, it's just something that you could also consult for your edification. Good friends, always trying to serve you. Uh, let's look at Second Kings. Okay, so we're back in the historical works there, back about a quarter of the way through the book. I looked it up the other day, actually. Psalm, what was it? Psalm 78, I think, is right in the middle of my Bible. So I often say Psalms or Isaiah are in the middle. I finally looked up. Where is the exact middle? Uh, Second Kings, chapter 13. Verse 2. Hmm. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, hmm. and followed the sins of Jeroboam and the son of Nebat, of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Yeah, see, depart is another. What what the Lord wants is for us to depart from those sins or those things that we've inherited and so on. That's next week. That's right. Depart, <laughs> well, but we can't get to the, the nouns are of the verbs and the verbs are of the nouns. Oh, we yeah. can't get there without looking at what, <laughs> what we're departing from. But you saw two words there, didn't you? Evil and sins. Mm -hmm. Those are the nouns. Mm -hmm. And then the depart is how I justify its inclusion in evil. Mm -hmm. the, uh, let's go to the right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's all right. That's good. Job. <laughs> let's turn to the right and see if we can find Job there, chapter 28. Wait, where's Joe? It is oh, to is. the left of the Psalms. Yeah. Okay. Alright. Chapter 28, verse 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to, and to depart from evil is understanding. It's kind of what I'm talking about, that there's information you can't even get to until you go through repentance. You, you have to walk the walk first and then you figure out uh, what it's talking about. So to depart from evil is understanding. I thought that was a striking phrase. Now again, mm -hmm. we're just getting these very generic words for what we need to depart from and, and so on and so forth. Okay, we have wrong and wickedness. Uh, you, it may not surprise you to know that there's also um, references in scripture to wicked ways and wicked works. It's interesting that scripture is so often kind of generic when it's talking about this. But I guess it's important to have sort of umbrella terms because there are all kinds of different individual evils and wrongs and, and bad things and so on. And then ra rather than emphasize one and miss the rest, it uses these kind of umbrella terms. Uh, there are references to evil doings, to abominations. Uh, let's look at Isaiah 59. So turn to the right, go through a few books, and we'll get to Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Chapter 59. Mm, it's a nice passage. 
verse 20. Who is the Lord going to come to when he comes as the Redeemer? The Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob. Yes, not to everybody, just to those who turn from transgression. Turn is another word we'll be looking at in our verb study. I'll warrant. But um, uh, transgressions, of course, the ever popular iniquity. Uh, <laughs> Hebrews <laughs> Hebrews um, speaks about dead works. Let's put iniquity and dead works. Again, we're still generic, aren't we? It's kind of curious that there are so many generic terms for what we need to repent of. Uh, turn all the way to the right to the book of Revelation. We get a little, little tiny little hint of what these things are. What are these sins and wrongs and so on? What's the nature of them? From Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Ah, let's look at verse 21 too. There's, it's talking about Jezebel. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. Ah, finally something concrete. Okay. <laughs> sexual immorality. That's more concrete, isn't it? Could be a range of things, but at least we're getting there. Immorality, okay. And she did not repent. Uh-oh. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Deeds, okay. I don't know which column to put deeds in. Maybe I'll put it in the middle in green. But obviously deeds are things you do, right? Mm -hmm. They're not just like a thought or a feeling or whatever. It's something you did. They didn't repent of their deeds. And the implication is that the deeds had something to do with this sexual immorality, which actually has a spiritual layer of meaning behind it, but um, uh, but that's what they need to repent from. What about adultery? Yeah, adultery is in there too. Yes, that's right, adultery. That's good. The um, uh. You have something similar in Revelation chapter 16, verse 11. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Mm. Yeah, so these are deeds and they didn't repent of them. They were, this process was supposed to help them repent and they didn't repent. Okay, how about Revelation 9, verse 20? Let's see if this gets a little more specific here. Blasphemy. Blasphemy, thank you. Blasphemy, all right, we're getting there. 9, verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. Ah, and look, it's going to specify. <gasps> That they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, mm. brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Okay, so the works of our hands, which seems a lot like deeds, and then I would just sum that up as idolatry, right? Worshiping idols and all that. Mm. <coughs> idolatry. Hmm. So finally, there's something sort of more specific, less generic there. In 21, mm. that's good. Uh, oh, please, do go on. And they did not repent of their murders. Oh, here we go. We hit the jackpot. Murders. Or their sorceries. Sorceries. Or their sexual immorality. Sexual immorality. Or their thefts. Thefts. Okay, now those are starting to have the ring of the Ten Commandments, aren't they? <laughs> Not the sorcery so much, but the thefts, the murders, the idolatry and adultery. You know, those those have a Ten Commandments sort of feel to them, don't they? Mm -hmm. And the Ten Commandments are a, a key to all this. 
And uh, how about the lovely, let's turn to the left and just go through the epistles of John and of Peter and you'll get to James there. If you get to Hebrews, you've gone too far to the left. I want James chapter 1, verse 21. A wonderful verse in the old King James. James. To the left. To the left of Peter. Yeah, that's right. There you go. Okay, James what? 121. 121. Good. Where are they at with Thessalonians? Thessalonians are too far to the left, so you want to head from the right to from the there and go through Hebrews and then James is right after the Hebrews. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You bet. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Okay, good. <coughs> all right. So, where would you put filthiness up here? It's just. You think it's be on the right? Maybe? Maybe. It's, it's quite generic, but it kind of communicates in a visceral way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. The whole filthiness and overflow, what was it? Overflow of wickedness. Mm. Or, I think your version says, superfluity of naughtiness. That's right. <laughs> we got to get naughtiness up there. I mean, come on. You can't go through all those childhood Christmases without naughtiness. <laughs> okay. That's right. We have part of filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And it's beautiful, the latter half of that verse. Can you read that again? And receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Yeah. You see, again, we get the sense that there's understanding, uh, there's salvation, there are good things. That's why we're talking about it now, because it's very core to salvation. Salvation lies on the other side of this process. If we can do this process... Then we get to salvation. Good. Okay. Well, let's have uh, let's let's look at some more concrete things, shall we? Uh, turn to the left and go through the epistles and see if you can find Second Corinthians. Chapter twelve. Just a little list. We're just warming up now. Verse 21, Paul is communicating directly with the Corinthians about problems that they're facing. And what does he say here in 2 Corinthians 12, 21? Lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before. Ah, you've sinned, okay. And have not repented of the uncleanness. Uh Uh-huh. Fornication and lewdness, which they have practiced. Uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness. All right? That's getting a little uncomfortable. What about Uh, 20? Yeah, 20 is cool. Tell tell me, tell me. Oh, boy, that's a good one. There you go. (laughs) For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish. And that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. Uh-huh. Lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbiting, <laughs> whisperings, conceits, tumults. Wonderful. There you go. Okay, so that's a little more concrete. You know, backbiting, you know, whispering. strife, whispering. Who hasn't done that? <laughs> yes, we're starting to get get serious here with the list. Uh, let me look up here real quick. Oh, and there's one in Jonah, chapter 3. Okay, so Jonah is in the Minor Prophets. So if you turn to the middle of your book here at the Psalms, turn to the right, you go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then you go through Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. So it's the fifth one in. And uh, we're looking for chapter, thank you for being good sports about all this, chapter 3, mm-hmm. verse 8. Jonah went to cry out to the Ninevites. And it happened when the sun arose that oh, God... Oops. 
Sorry, that three was four. Eight. Sorry, okay. that was four verse eight. No problem. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth uh -huh. and cry mightily to God. Mm. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way. The evil way. Okay, so everyone should turn from their evil way. And from the violence that is in his hands. Violence. Good word, huh? Mm -hmm. That's another thing we should turn from. Okay, we'll be talking more about turning when we get to the verbs. But do you, you, you begin to feel like we've got some nouns mm -hmm. going on up here? Mm -hmm. We're starting to see we've got some very generic nouns, and they may be a little frustratingly generic. And these nice concrete things uh, might hit a little too close to home, a few of them, or, or, or whatever. Uh, that's the that's the uh, thing about about repentance. It, it can uh, hit close to home. Uh, what I'd like to do now, good friends, with your indulgence, is I want to read you a list. Um, some adjectives will be involved. I want to read to you a list of just things that the Apostle Paul mentions. Paul has a habit, which we just saw with the backbitings and the tumults and conceit and all those sorts of things. He has a habit of listing evils. And I must say, Paul has an amazing mind uh, because he, he can really amass some good lists. If you need lists of things to work on, if you need sort of a menu to, to, to prompt your reflection, uh, Paul can provide that. So I want to take you through a list. There are sort of three parts to this list, uh, these lists. Uh, he mentions types of people or sorts of persons that you don't want to be if you're trying to live a good life. He talks about things that you shouldn't do, and this, this list would be things. Fornication, violence, you know, that's what I mean by a thing, a practice uh, that you don't want to do. And then also he has adjectives of the type of person that you don't want to be. And so I want to give you these three uh, lists that I amassed out of the epistles. Um, let's first start with the sort of person. Uh, you don't want to be, do you, friend, this sort of person. You don't want to be a covenant breaker. You don't want to be an idolater, a railer, an extortioner an adulterer, a thief, a reviler. You don't want to be a sinner, do you? A manslayer, a whoremonger, a man-stealer, a liar, a perjured person, a brawler, a striker, a tattler, a busybody, a lover of your own self, a truce breaker, a false accuser, a despiser of those who are good. A traitor, a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God, and you don't want to be a reprobate to every good work. <laughs> That's a list of types of people that Paul says we should not be. And then Paul says also certain practices or things that we shouldn't be doing. We shouldn't do fornication. We shouldn't practice covetousness, maliciousness, <coughs> envy, debate is an interesting one, <laughs> murder, deceit, malignity, we just saw whispering, we just saw backbiting, how about hating God, what about boasting, inventing evil things, an interesting category isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, don't be an inventor of new evil things. Uh, don't practice unrighteousness, wickedness, rioting, drunkenness, chambering, which has to do with sexual immorality, wantonness, strife. Don't practice wrath. We saw there, the, I forget what the word was in the New King James, and the Old King James is swellings. Um, <laughs> it, it's about pride. I think it said conceit. In, yeah. Uh, tumults, uncleanness, lasciviousness, witchcraft, hatred, 
variants, emulations, interesting one, seditions, heresies, revelings, inordinate affection, something we shouldn't practice, evil concupiscence, anger, blasphemy, which we have on our list. How about filthy communication out of your mouth? It's a good one. Uh, evil surmisings. <laughs> uh, that's so interesting. How about perverse disputings on the part of people of corrupt minds? Don't do that either. <laughs> uh, speaking evil of others. Uh, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. And finally, hating one another. We already had hatred somewhere else on the list that specifies hating one another. So those are practices that Paul speaks against in this wonderful list. And finally, there are adjectives for the type of person that you should look at to see whether you are this sort of person or not. Are you spiteful? Are you proud? Disobedient to your parents? Uh, lacking in natural affection? Interesting. Implacable. Unmerciful. Are you lawless? Disobedient. Ungodly. Unholy. Profane. Given to wine. Greedy of filthy lucre. That's a good one. About, you know, trying to get too much money and so on. Uh, how about double tongued? Mm -hmm. You've pondered that one. Idle. Knowing nothing. That'd be interesting to repent of knowing nothing. Uh, that's interesting. <laughs> Doting about questions and stripes of words. Destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. Mm. I think there's some of that in our world, that gain is godliness. You know, there's something righteous about just sheer acquisition or something. Unthankful, fierce, heady, high-minded, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, self-willed, soon angry, just plain abominable, <laughs> foolish, and interestingly, deceived. All told, those are 95 different terms that, that Paul has. When, when we really look at it, Scripture is trying to help us with this process, and it actually has way too much specificity. We might have started with a list of things like sin, wrong, wickedness, and well, I don't know what that is. But we know what backbiting is. We know what it is to be a lover of pleasure more than being a, a lover of God. We know what it, being a traitor is or, or being double-tongued and, and so on. Uh, uh, scripture actually has uh, lots of details, lots of specificity about what we need to work on. Um, so... Uh, what we'll be talking about next time is getting into the verbs, which is getting into examining ourselves for these things. Part of what Scripture wants to do, I, uh, Scripture's amazing to me in the sense, I don't know if you have this sense, but gradually as I've been reading, the sense has been developing in me that there's both this wonderful sense of mercy, actually, in Scripture. We haven't been looking at merciful passages tonight. Uh, but the, except that mention of the heavens rejoicing over someone who repents. But there's beautiful things in there about, you know, uh, you have not chosen me, I have chosen you, says the Lord, and, and that the Lord will bring anybody from anywhere with, with loving kindness have I drawn me, and uh, I know the plans I have for you, plans of peace and not of evil and so forth. There's many, many beautiful, merciful teachings about the Lord and repentance is actually a very, very merciful thing. It doesn't feel like it when you're going through it, but there's, a, there's tremendous mercy in repentance. But there's also, I, I don't know, the analogy that came to mind, one analogy was that um, the word has lips that, that are kind, that are, that are soft. The word also has teeth. Doesn't it? Like, 
it's kind of nice to know in this world where you can have such a mushy sense of is this okay and I don't know some people are doing it and I don't know we all don't know what's right from wrong or you know everything's sort of uh, relative and and flexible and being redefined and, and all that kind of stuff and I kind of although it can make you feel terrible sometimes uh, I like the fact that scripture has teeth in it there's a sense of clarity of you know I'm amazed, but it's true that, that in our world there are numbers of people, I wouldn't hazard a guess how many, but there are numbers of people, I gather, who really believe that uh, evil's gone out of style. You know, there's no such thing. There isn't, you know, pe people are good, and, and there's an inherent goodness and, and so forth, and I'm not saying all of that is wrong, uh, but there's a kind of, you know, uh, a lot of a lot more people believe in heaven than believe in hell. That's just you know they've done the research and asked people and so forth. A lot more people believe in heaven than believe in hell, and it, it's amazing that we can get sort of fuzzy about. Well, I don't know if any you know they they probably they were just you know I don't know they they probably mean well and it's good to have those sorts of thoughts about people. But there's also something bracing about the Lord just coming in the Word and just saying, look, there is something called evil. And evil's evil. It's bad. It's corrupt. It's wicked. It wants to destroy and harm. There are people in this world who love to destroy others. Um, this is a tiny little point. Uh, I've, been, I've been praying and meditating on this uh, flight that got lost in an amazing mm -hmm. circumstance. And, and also moving to see how, you know, 200 people get lost on a plane and billions of people go, what happened? What happened? You know, it's very moving. There's no such thing as 200 people we don't care about. We, we care about those people. And uh, just one little tiny point that I wanted to bring in here was that astounding stat that Interpol has a little used list of stolen travel documents. And you probably heard how many of these things there are. 40 million stolen travel documents. 40 million! Wow! Well, do you think that was one extremely successful thief? Probably not, you know? There's a system, you know, there are people who are stealing travel, you know, how, do you, how does Interpol get a list of 40 million stolen documents if there's no evil in the world, you know? Somebody's doing this. And you can't turn on the news at night without seeing things, crazy things that, that people are doing to other people and so on. I'm amazed that hell has managed to convince the human race that, no, we sort of got over that evil thing. Yeah, they used to be evil in the Middle Ages, but, you know, we're, we're not... <laughs> well, we, we just managed to hide some of it, you know, sometimes or whatever. But uh, elite, evil is alive and well. And really, the word has kind of taken it easy on us here. You know, human trafficking and abuse and the horrible, horrible things that people do to each other. And this is kind of actually sort of a nice list of just saying more murder, fornication, and so on. These are general categories that, that you should look at. Um, evil is alive and well and, and something that we need to look at. And part of what's important about this is that uh, when we first start to look at ourselves, we may feel, um, well, I don't have that problem, and I don't have that problem. In fact, I've got very few, you know, that whole list of 95 things, maybe there's three of them, you know. I, you know, there's maybe a couple of those I could work on. But, you know, fortunately, I don't have all the rest of those. I don't know if some of you were here in that Bible study recently where the where they, was it a, a Pharisee who said, you know, thank God I'm not like other people. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Um, uh, part of the purpose and part of why it's work, why I liken it to, to hunting or, or to, you know, shopping for something that's sort of difficult to find or whatever the analogy would be, is that it takes some work to recognize these things. You know, you need to be able to tell Again, I used an underwater analogy a few weeks ago. I've been watching these underwater shows, and it's so amazing how everything down there is trying to disguise itself as something else, and there's this whole game going on of how much can you look like 
you know, just a leaf or a piece of flotsam and jetsam that floated down or looked like a rock or, or something else. And, and they're, they're all trying to fool each other. And so when we're going looking for these things, uh, a fact of life, it's just a fact of life, Swedenborg talks about it in a wonderful way, that it's much easier for us, uh, and I, I don't even think it's entirely wrong, it's much easier for us to identify these things in others, is it not? <laughs> uh, it, you know, we can look at others and we can see, you know, that's backbiting, or you, you know, you're always negative. Everything that comes out of your mouth, negative, negative, negative. You know, uh, we can see that so easily about other people. But with us, it's our own little treasured, you know, <laughs> the treasured sort of thing. Um, there's this little poem. Uh, you know, worse than the beast I fear is the evil I love. Uh, we don't realize that these things are a threat to us because we love them and we're, we're attached to them in some way. Uh, but they actually don't intend us well. They're not good things for us. And as I say, the Lord wants to create some separation between us and these things. The Lord is very gentle. He advises us, even though I talk about repentance every week and so on. Uh, he, the, we are advised to do this once or twice a year that will notice a difference if we do you know and what I'm talking about is not that kind of daily look at your life after you get into this practice for a while you're sort of always monitoring but uh, once or twice a year it's good I like to do it around Easter time and around Christmas time it just seems like the end of the year is a good time and, and Easter is a good time to, to, to pause you know actually take a few hours and reflect on an issue, and I'm amazed at how when I'm getting ready to do this, the Lord will just bring things to my consciousness. You know, I, I'll start to, there'll be episodes, or somebody will say something, or I'll go through something, have a dream, whatever it is, that will, you know, some some issue on one of these lists will just surface. Uh, we're told to just pick one or two things. We don't have to do the whole laundry list, the 95, you know, uh, you actually can't, work effectively on 95 evils and sins and <laughs> things at, at once. Uh, that's not the way the Lord intends for this to go. Just pick one or two because it's amazing how the Lord will quicken the process and those who keep one commandment keep them all. You know, if you can just get, get one of them in a little better shape, the Lord will bring you along through the rest as I'm sure you've experienced, friends. It's, a very, it's actually a very good process even if you do it badly, the Lord will give you full credit and extra credit. And, and uh, uh, the Lord is very kind and merciful because he and the heavens are really rooting for you to go through this. Uh, the Lord has set everything up. It's the order of the universe. I didn't make the rules. It's the order of the universe uh, that the Lord cannot barge into your house and just take away your evil especially something you're attached to. If you love that, if it's something you've thought about and contemplated and done with some kind of intention, it's part of your house for, ne for now. Uh, the Lord would like to separate you from that thing, but he really is all right with, if you want to stay with it, he really is okay with that. I mean, that's not his desired outcome. But in other words, he will allow us to have the things that we love because love is a very important thing. Freedom, as I talked about before, very important thing rationality. The Lord wants us to be free. We have to freely choose to go through this process and there'll be a lot of freedom in it, including the sense, as you probably experienced, uh, where you're not sure if you're doing it right or, you know, am I doing this the right way? Did I do it enough or am I being too hard on myself? Because remember that, that, that hell is on the field as well and if you start to look like you want to repent, hell is going to figure out a counter move pretty quickly. They'll say, oh great, yeah, let's see if we can get all 95, you know, like a birder's watch list or something, you know, see if we can <laughs> they try to overdo it or just beat yourself up relentlessly about, about something, you know. That's not what the exercise is. We'll talk more next time when we talk about the verbs, about what, what all it entails. There's some quite simple steps. And when I think about how brief the Ten Commandments are, I, I forget, are they 183 words or something? It's very short. What a short list. The Lord's provide, you know, the Lord didn't want to make it a complicated thing, you know, like the U.S. tax code, which is another thing that's timely right now. Uh, but, 
uh, you know, just like thousands and thousands of pages that you have to master, and they're so arcane that lawyers fight endlessly about what this or that means and so on. Uh, the Lord's just given us this, this simple list, and even though it's got Ten Commandments on it, it really breaks down to four, four main things, you know, the adultery, the stealing, the killing, the bearing false witness, uh, you know, which is like malicious lying or lying that's harmful uh, to others and so on. Uh, and then coveting uh, are the main things that we need to we need to think about, and the and, and the Lord will take us through that. These things are sneaky and they hide. They hide. Uh, others can see them more clearly than we can than we can see them. And so part of the exercise of repentance is to try to get familiar through the Word and all those wonderful stories in the Word, because it's these are not theoretical in the Word, are they? You can see people blaspheme. You can see people killing and committing adultery. You know, you, it, it's just laid out there. The, the, what they're thinking, what they did, the, the whole thing is, is out there in plain view. So we can see it objectively in the Word, which is wonderful. We can see what evil looks like. Then to try to pick that up and then ask the Lord, what in my life bears any resemblance to this? You know, uh, maybe we're fortunate enough that we're not shedding blood or shooting people or whatever, uh, but are there subtle ways in which we tear people down or do we have hatred in our heart or resentment or things like that? Do we, ha do we have these things? You know, okay, you may not be committing adultery, but, but how do you feel when you see these things on TV or ads? Or, you know, what's in your heart? And so uh, the Lord says those who... Uh, Look on a woman to lust after her, which I think is important. The, the purpose of that looking, if the purpose of that looking is to lust, then that's committing adultery already in your heart. The Lord says, examine this very closely because it's, it's a, um, these are subtle foes. You know, we're, we're wrapped and enveloped. Uh, Swedenborg is so great on this topic that evil and falsity go together. Falsity means those sort of lies, that anything, we're very aware of them in other people, but in ourselves we can't tell because we sort of half the time fool ourselves with, with our story about it. Well, no, it's not that. It's just that, you know, in my case, whatever, and you change the language, and then it works out that it's okay for you to do that. Um, it's hard to escape that orbit. I just love the word because... It, it gives that clarity, the light of heaven. You know, where can we find that? If we're just lost in our own minds and our own hearts, it's hard for us to find the way. But with the word saying, look, here's what's clear. And it's not saying you are expected in the next five days or five years or 50 years to get completely free of this issue. It's not talking about that. When we talk about the verbs, it's just talking about turn. You know, lay it aside. Just, just change direction a little bit here. You know, just, just turn away from it. Uh, try to lay that aside. Try not to have that right front and center. It's going to be on the periphery, and you're moving in a different direction. Uh, that's what the Lord wants. He knows that we can't achieve perfection. Job 15:15. 15, 15, the Lord puts no trust in His saints, and the heavens are not pure in His sight. We, if the heavens are not pure, you know, we're not going to get pure in five minutes or, or, or 50 years of doing this process. But the Lord needs to see us doing our response, taking up our cross daily and following him, denying ourselves. That's all about this repentance process. So, friends, have I talked about <coughs> some nouns and some adjectives? Have I satisfied that topic? Uh, that this is the material is these wrongs. And you notice a lot of them have to do with our relationship with our neighbor and some of them that blasphemy and so on have to do with our relationship with God. Uh, it's really in that in that context that, that, that most of this stuff erupts. So I hope you'll tune in next week and hear about the verbs because it's going to be great fun and can you join me in a closing prayer? <laughs> Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank you for your mercy, for the kindness of your heart, but also the clarity of your mind, 
We pray, as we are able to take it, Lord, that you reveal a little bit of ourselves to us so that we can see the next thing you would have us work on. It's a process. It's progress. Help us to step forward, Lord, this one step at a time in your direction so that we may put a little bit of distance between us and these issues. Thank you, Lord. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so on the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's keep on repenting, friends. Now we know what we're looking for. <laughs>